On January 9th, 1941, the premier British bomber of World War II, the Avro Lancaster, made its maiden flight. The Lank, as it was known, was the main British bomber that carried the war to Nazi Germany. <laughs> This is the death of the battleship Turbots. RAF Lancasters roar to the attack. And here is the 45,000 ton pride of the German Navy firing desperately at the air raiders. A six ton armor piercing blockbuster is on its way. The Turbots is mortally hit, but replies with everything, including 15 inch guns, in this climactic battle of Tromso Fjord in Norway. Another near hit. The RAF is scoring after two previous unsuccessful attempts from Scottish bases 1,200 miles away. Another blockbuster heads for the target. Perfect weather sweeps away the defensive smoke screen. And another hit is registered. These RAF pictures show the death agonies of the crippled monster. Months of preparation went into the assault. The RAF, in sinking the Turpits, turned in one of its greatest jobs. With its enormous bomb bay, the Lancaster was capable of carrying the biggest bomb load and the largest single bomb. It was the only airplane of the war that could haul blockbuster giant bombs of 8,000, 12,000, and 22,000 pounds, while also carrying all the conventional bombs, as well as anti-ship mines, incendiaries or fire bombs, and the dam buster specialty bomb used for attacking dams. The versatile four engine heavy bomber was powered by the famous Rolls-Royce Merlin engines that also powered the Mustang and Spitfire fighters. The Lancaster was defended by four electric powered turrets containing two Browning 303 machine guns each, except for the tail turret that had four machine guns. The bomber had originally been designed with a belly turret, but when that proved impractical, it was quickly removed. Its normal armament of eight 303 caliber machine guns was far lighter, however, than the 12 or more 50 caliber guns that defended the American B-17 and B-24 heavy bombers. All three of those planes had similar speed and performance though. Later, when the Germans exploited the lack of defensive firepower under the bombers, the resourceful British airmen often jury-rigged a 50 caliber or 20 millimeter machine gun to fire at fighters who attacked from below. Although used mostly as a night bomber, the Lancaster was sometimes used for precision daylight targets as well, especially when it carried the Tallboy and Grand Slam earthquake bombs. Over 7,300 of these rugged airplanes were built at a cost of around 50,000 pounds each. The last Lancaster was retired from service by the Royal Canadian Air Force, RCAF, in 1963. British veterans claim the Lancaster was the greatest bomber of World War II, or even of all time, while American fans of B-17s and B-24s point out the heavier defensive firepower and greater numbers of the U.S. bombers. Either way, the Lancaster is certainly the greatest British bomber, and you could decide for yourself if it eclipsed the Flying Fortress and the Liberator. As a question for my students, please let us know what you think. And if you're curious as to which bomber is the favorite of your narrator, Dr. Czar, well, I'll let Academy Award-winning American actor turned United States Army Air Forces pilot James Stewart tell you all about it. Well, let's shake hands with Mr. B-17 and a few of his big brothers. Now watch out now, he's tough. Those four motors roaring through the sky like a thunderstorm, they can't fool with them. American workmen, the finest master mechanics in the world, put those motors together. Made them live, made them breathe, made them roar. There are a whole army of workmen, designers, engineers, and just plain guys who wanted to do something for their country. They put that B-17 together. 
A few thousand of these babies will win this war for us. And a few thousand guys like you in there flying. And remember, we said something about a team. Well, nine men are inside that plane, each with an important job to do. So let's go and take a look around. Let's meet the team. Yes, sir, nine fellas like yourself working together as closely coordinated as a precision watch. Now get this straight. The pilot is not the most important fellow inside this plane. All nine members of the crew are equally important. For example, the pilot and the co-pilot can take the plane off the ground and set it back down again, but where would they be without the navigator? Now meet him. He's the gentleman sitting right there. His pencils, calculators, He's responsible for getting the giant bomber to its destination and back again. Now, you might like his job. Now, this fellow's a second lieutenant, draws $245 each month, and although he was good at mathematics, he didn't graduate from college. But he learned that the Air Forces could use his talents, and now he's a necessary part of the team. And now let's go up into the nose of Mr. B-17 and meet somebody who has an important job in that department. This is the bombardier, the boy who doesn't miss. You see, flying the plane is wasted motion unless this lad hits the target on the noggin. The finest pilots in the Air Force would be behind the eight ball if the bombardier couldn't hit straight. And he's a full-fledged commission officer, too, wears his wings, draws the same pay as the pilot or the co-pilot. Now, back on the main body of the plane, we've got some more important positions. This fellow is the number one engineer. He keeps the motors turning and the thousands of working parts all through the bomber inspected and in repair. And then comes the radio operator who keeps the bomber in constant communication with its home base. And the photographer who keeps a photographic record of what takes place on the earth below while the bomber's on its mission. He's sort of an official scorekeeper checking up for future reference. Now the remaining members of the flight crew are number two engineer and number two radio man. So you see, being in the Air Forces isn't all piloting, or all navigating, or all bombardering. It's teamwork. If you like this video and would like to receive notification of new videos, please feel welcome to subscribe to History and Headlines. Your viewership is much appreciated. But before you go, there's one last thing I would like to tell you. The video playing in the background during the credits is going to show you the Disney rocket-assisted bombs first use on U-boat pens at a port in the Netherlands in 1945. One bomb is under each wing of the B-17 Flying Fortresses.